Welcome to episode 12 of Mayhem and Measurement, presented by Metrics Agency. I'm Chris Book, joined by Chris Itzema. Hello. Appreciate it. And, some... hold up, and. And. Brian Renner. Should, should I have introduced the guest already? Unbelievable. I, I had a whole bit here, you know, <laughs> and you know, right, right after we got through the housekeeping, where I was going to introduce you and you know, really put you in the spotlight. Well, I'm here now. Good enough. All well, right. I guess the cat's out of the bag on that one. Welcome, it, Brian. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> I'll do the honors. <laughs> Wonderful introduction. Oh, we are stumbling <laughs> through this one. Anyway, let's get this back on track here. If you want to get in touch with the show, drop us a line, info at metricsagency.com. You can get in touch with me at Chris Book on Twitter and LinkedIn, and Chris Sietsema on Twitter at Sietsema, S-I-E-T-S-E-M-A, and on LinkedIn as well. Brian, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, just go to the website, brianrenner.com. It's Brian with an I. And R E N N E R, like my cousin Jeremy Renner. dot com. See the resemblance. That's uh, yeah. It's in the all in the nose. You're probably good yeah. at archery as well. Indeed. Right. There you have it. If you want to support the show, a couple things you can do. First of all, subscribe to the show wherever you get your podcast. Leave us a great rating, and definitely be sure to tell all your friends that you have discovered the greatest podcast in the history of humanity, and you're using it to improve your analytics prowess. Chris likes to go over the top. I'm not sure that's over the top. That's pretty subtle. Yeah. I think we're liberating people. Anyway, the cat's out of the bag on Mr. Renner here, but the topic for tonight is buzzwords, or to be maybe a little more direct, buzzwords that we hate. And one of the reasons, among many, that, that we like Brian here is that Brian has compiled what, at least at the moment, I believe to be, is the world's most comprehensive thorough and complete list of buzzwords. Can I tell a little story? I think you should. So we used to, Brian and I used to work together at an agency uh, in Phoenix. And when we first started working together, I'm like, this guy is always taking notes. He is just <laughs> so studious. He is on it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Little did I know, actually I found out later because he'd actually share the content of those notes with me, <laughs> that yeah, he was writing down some things that pertain to the conversation that we were having true but he also had like like liner notes in the margins that were he was just tracking down what people were saying that was a little bit out of the norm or a total crutch or a buzzword is mm -hmm. that fair to say brian yep and there's a one specific crutch that i know that you know one of the leaders of that company used quite a bit um but yeah the it's funny that you mentioned the liner notes the the space kind of the margin on the side i totally forgot that that's actually where i kept the important stuff you know like oh the i know words. because i would look at your notes every every meeting from then on and i'm like holy shit how many times did he write something down that i just said yeah did you <laughs> become careful of it no i was cognizant of it though it kind of kept me on my game to not use a a buzzword see that's the tough part is you don't necessarily want to make it a a, a thing that's known you don't want to make everybody aware because they start watching what they're saying but then they kind of slip back into their comfort zone and start using them again, and you'll hear them pop up. So there's definitely no shortage of buzzwords, even if people do realize, oh, I say this a little bit more than normal. But it was kind of fun because w when something would happen from that, from that point on, and we both hear a buzzword, we'd kind of give each other a little, <laughs> yeah. like a little hat tip, uh, yep. like, like yep. a little, uh, uh -huh. mm -hmm. little we'll inside joke. Yeah. Yep. Anybody ever approach you and say, hey, man, I don't want my name on that list, or I said something, I want you to take it off? No. Uh, I, I think I kept it a secret enough to make sure that that didn't happen, because I, I, I covered this list. I, it's, a, it's pretty important to me. Um, one thing I did do, in fact, there, there was a, uh, a manager that I had uh, that was, was pretty good at the buzzwords, and he used a very consistent set of them, like, you know, couple dozen or so. And so he ended up going to the San Francisco branch. So what we would do in the Scottsdale branch is we would hop on these weekly calls and he would be on them and we would play buzzword bingo with all of the other locations <laughs> around the country, Chicago, New York. Um, so he was the source of the bingo calls in San Francisco and we would all be on our, our phone calls in various other locations. I would create a randomized bingo list. Give us some examples. <laughs> like, what would be on this list? 
he would say, uh, you know, there was a sniff that he would do, like the uh, self-satisfied after he said something really oh, important. Really? Oh, yeah, he had the sniff. Oh, that's infuriating. He would do it all the time. And so that was one of the main ones that he would do. Um, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> that's okay. Uh, there Sounds were... like Charlie Sheen there. <laughs> but there were quite a few. And so we had to figure out a, a way to call out bingo without anybody else catching on, with, especially him. So we would have a, a sign where we'd say, all right, if I would email out and say, if anybody gets bingo, if everybody fills out based on the, the buzzwords that he has said on this call, somebody chime in from their office and say, hey, I've got a question. Oh, wait, never mind. And that would be the clue that they had gotten bingo. And we only got a full card a couple times, but it was it was a uh, it made that meeting something to look forward to. Genius. Yeah. Was there a reward? Like everybody has the guy buy that guy a beer? Or... Well, isn't pride the ultimate oh, reward? Thank you. You can't really put a price tag on something like that. You're right. Yeah, I stand correct. <laughs> I actually think I know who that is. Potentially. So, qu- question becomes. Why do we use buzzwords in the first place? They work. Do they? I use them all the time. All the time. Oh, boy. Here They're very go. relatable. People know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> they help you essentially make something very, that's very complicated, very simple for those who are not learned in your subject matter. I think Makes it relatable. Well, I, I think there's multiple levels of buzzwords. There are, there are buzzwords when you're using them to help people understand, to, to relate to people like you just talked about. There's also buzzwords where, from best I can tell, your sole purpose is to annoy everybody else on the planet. I have some examples of those, yeah. So just, just to throw something out there. Purposefully or unaware, like you're unaware of the fact I, that you I think they're unaware, but I don't understand how anybody could do it unless their sole purpose was to annoy people. Gotcha. Now, at the risk of alienating our uh, relatively young and, and new audience, let's just throw one of these out there, perhaps. If the word ninja is in your social media title, like on LinkedIn or something, you're in that category. I feel that one's kind of been cycled out, thankfully. I don't see that one as much anymore. Guru, I hear all the time. It's been mm-hmm. replaced by rock star. Rock star. Oh, yeah. If you were Guru. a rock star, you'd be playing on stage with Dave Grohl. Sage. But you're not. You're sitting at a desk. So let's not confuse the two. Sherpa. <laughs> Lame. Prophet. Prophet. You're seeing profit thrown around? That the guy from Yahoo uh several years ago. I forget exactly what his title, but I think profit was in it. He had a little bit of a complex. It's that bad. You ever feel like it's just all over? It like is. there's nowhere to go but down. Well, but then you think about it, there are some people that use it almost like poetry. They're almost like modern day poets that exist among us. Like they can weave one one buzzword into another. Yep. Yep. I have an example of a uh, long-winded buzzword filled phrase. Let it rip. You're such I a heard. prepared guest. I, lo- <laughs> I, I absolutely love this. All right. You got to, I feel like there should be a kind of a warm up because this really, this really is. This is like a grand weird. finale. It's, firework. It, it, yeah. Kind of, yeah. I don't want to, you know, blow my load all over uh, in, in one buzzword attempt. I can, I can see your <laughs> your sheet from here, and you've got all these. There, it's like one line, one line, one line. There's uh-huh. there's hundreds of them at one line, and then there's a chunk, and then I see this block that's probably a good fifth of your page. Yeah. It's like an essay. So within that one, there are several. All right, so I'll I'll try to go through this. I want to ensure that blank company is directly tied to the continuous stream of ad platform innovations being rolled out by the search engines. It is a top priority for us to be lockstep with the engines. So we will have the ability to manage new media in an action-based format for our clients for planning. A top priority is continuing to conduct the full market analyses of our clients, consumers to deploy comprehensive strategies across all forms of content. My head exploded when I saw that in an email. That is unbelievable. Everybody who is on Twitter should immediately go to a an account called Douchebag Strat at at Douchebag Strat. <laughs> I feel like I've seen that one. I haven't seen it. It is so good. Up here. It is so good. It's that kind of stuff mm-hmm. over and over and over again. Like uh it just quotes from from 
agency types who say these types of things like cloud intelligence is taking over visual conversion and uh, every brand now needs a stackable B2B strategy. <laughs> it's gold. <laughs> if you've ever worked with an agency or for an agency, it'll be relatable. I remember when, when I started working in the agency business, I was, was I 20 maybe? I think I was, I think I was 20. And, you know, so I had no like office experience b before this. But I remember I heard someone in a meeting say, put lipstick on the pig. And at the time, I was like, oh, wow, that's really cool. You get to talk and use cool lingo and everything. It took about three months before I realized that this, this isn't good. It's not good at all. It, I think it's great. Well, it, I know you do, and I'll tell you why. Because if I'm looking, I'm looking at our show sheet right now, the show we, we prep with kind of our loose outline for what we're going to go through. And one of the questions that I put in here is, and I quote, does anyone use buzzwords well? I do. My compatriot here responded mm -hmm. with, I do. That, that's the only note that we have for, for this right now. I would have to concur. I agree. Because I've had some uh, buzzwords. Thank you, Brian. Yep, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I, have a, I have an example. And so Chris has a way of using buzzwords that aren't the mainstream buzzwords. They're like, uh, you know, a side salad of account planning. So, you know, if you have a full suite of services with a side salad of account planning, I think that's a nice little uh, interjection. One of my favorites is when someone's been dressed down by someone in, the, in their company or like by a client or whomever or superior. And this is one that my dad used to use. It's called, well... I guess she told you how the cow ate the cabbage. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but well, I it like makes it. you think. It does yeah. She like that basically means like she she's told you what's up. I I, I understand <laughs> what it means. I just I'm not quite sure about the mechanics of where the cow. it came from. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> probably a farm. I don't know. Do they eat cabbage? I don't know. All right, I'll tell you about it. These I are the things you think about when when something like that comes up. Cabbage is good for gut health. I so I don't, I don't know if the cattle community cares about that. I don't, I don't know. I haven't seen any cows walking around wearing kale t-shirts, but I suppose anything's possible. Although I kind of feel like farm and maybe the Midwest gave us the buzzwords to begin with. Probably. There's a, there's a lot of that. I think they've always existed, but they just change over time and with the industries perhaps. I can't imagine the ancient Greeks or the Romans, you know, walking around with their beards and their shirts off, you know, with 18 abs, lifting a thousand pounds, using buzzwords. Well, I think, you know, again, I, I think one of the reasons they find their way into our vocabulary is because they're effective. People can immediately understand, not necessarily what the cow with the cabbage, but can immediately understand what it is you're talking about to make, again, something that you might not understand initially make, make a lot of sense. So vis-a-vis... -vis... <laughs> <laughs> But to, to that end, I do still think there's two levels. Of, there's people like you that are really good at using them to relate to people and to make your point. I don't believe you. <laughs> What's that? You say that, but I don't think you believe that. <laughs> no, no, I, I think you're wrong about certain things. I think you're wrong about waffle fries, for instance. But I do think you use buzzwords quite well. And, and you, but you don't, you don't use them as buzzwords. You use them to relate people to make a point. That's totally different than these guys that we we see up here on stage, you know, that have the evangelist roles with a tech company that are basically shiny salesmen with them. Or, uh, the, or they use them as crutch words. Yeah. I don't think they even know what they mean half yeah. the time. Almost like a filler. Well, that's yeah. when they're dangerous is when, when they don't convey any meaning or they're used incorrectly. Uh, that's, that's when they're trouble because they just make you look stupid. Sure. Let's get into some of our, some of our favorites here. I think one that most people probably don't even recognize as, as a buzzword or a buzz phrase, if we will, anymore, just because it said so much, move the needle. Mm. But I haven't forgotten. What does that mean to you? Presumably, it means to make some type of measured improvement. I just see it as a change in general, because the needle's always moving on attack. Car wise, I guess from, the needle can go down. You're right. From automotive uh, terms, the needles never stay yeah. in the same yeah. unless you're on cruise control. RPM wise, it's always yeah. up and down. Yeah. yeah. So technically, everything is always moving the needle. 
So then it comes back to what does it mean? Nothing. Because everything's always changing <laughs> in flux. And if it's a speedometer, sometimes you want to move the needle down because you got to slam on your brake. Yeah. See a speed trap coming up? Now what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think anybody in the history of the world expected anybody to get this far and in depth into it, but. Low hanging fruit is another one. That one's easy. It has meaning. I feel like that one does have meaning. It's just overused, maybe? It's overused, yeah. But, it, but there are things that are low-hanging fruit that are easy to grab that have a big impact. They fill your bushel. Especially in comparison to high-hanging fruit. Mm, hard to get to. Only giraffes can get them. Yeah. Why waste your time if there's some low-hanging fruit? Exactly. So going back to the uh, farming analogy, I think that's obviously one that comes straight from farming low-hanging fruit here's my problem with low-hanging fruit nobody gets excited about low-hanging fruit you know any, anytime someone says low-hanging fruit it's kind of like the wind just goes out of the room you're like oh well, i guess this isn't gonna be the quarter we do anything cool <laughs> just getting some uh, easy wins in the books yeah, yeah. i'll Cause... tell you who says low-hanging fruit the executive that's bouncing from one division to the next within his company and just needs to do something quick before he rolls out and leaves that division a flaming pile Mm. Not that I know from experience. <laughs> <laughs> Counterpoint. Sometimes I think it is worthwhile to grasp the low hanging fruit if you're working simultaneously toward that more difficult goal or that that not often achieved objective. So if you're just kind of, you know, keeping things going and trying to get some things done while you're working towards something greater, I think it's okay. But to, to your point, I totally see that more often than not where it's, let's just take the easy way out. Let me translate. Quick wins. Yep. Quick wins. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Another one. Just, it doesn't excite me. And, and if you have to have a meeting to talk about it, you're not doing anything right anyway. Can I ask a question? Oh, Are you, either of you guys uh, growth hackers? <laughs> <laughs> That's another one. Uh, hacks. Like uh, 21 ways to hack your life. Like lifehacker.com. Life yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like, here, here's a life hack. Take a shower. It'll make your day better. <laughs> Holy cats. I never thought about that. Sometimes I do need to be reminded about that. I work from home. <laughs> Three o'clock rolls around. I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, the, the growth hacker thing is out of control. And I'm willing, I'm not, I'm not going to say I'm willing to bet, but it at least seems that these days, one out of, 20 let's say profiles on linkedin has growth hacker in it fair that's a sad state of affairs i don't i could i can neither confirm nor deny but yeah i, I do see a lot of that and it's terribly upsetting <laughs> i had a growth hacker contact me the other day how did this happen and what was the pitch well should we should we tell what happened with your with your phone with my phone you know with your uh oh you've been getting some with my some, phone um, you probably heard all kinds of buzzwords after this happened. I invented a few buzzwords after this happened, although unfortunately they were all four letters. So my wife was doing some research and accidentally entered my phone number in either a health or life insurance form online. Uh -uh. And in the past two weeks, I've gotten somewhere between 2,500 and 3,000 telemarketing calls. Oh. He's not joking. Oh. I was sitting next to him the other day. Your, your phone's off right now, obviously. It, it, it is off now. But I was sitting next to him the other day for 30 minutes, and it went off, I want to say, low estimate, 12 times. That, that was, and that was a good day. It's, I'm finally at the point where I've got enough numbers. I've got several hundred numbers blocked now. Mm -hmm. But the first day, it was at least every minute for about 12 hours. And then they started probably 5, 30, 6 o'clock in the morning, and they'd go all night or all day and then end at night. What you were saying about the call you got oh, from the growth hacker. Yes, this was not one of these calls. So the growth hacker addressed me the way I imagine any growth hacker would address me. We were talking about uh, Chicago versus New York, and I'm not a big New York fan. I, I lived in Chicago. I love Chicago. Had two Stanley Cups in Chicago in a World Series. I had a good run there. And... uh he had just gotten back from New York and was talking about all of New York's fine pleasures, energies, and all this stuff. And I said, yeah, 
New York's nice. I always have a soft spot for Chicago, though. And he said something to me that I will never forget. He said, That's right, bro, dog. I forgot you're mad rep in Chicago straight up for real. Oh. I just got douche chills. <laughs> Do you say douche chills or douche chills? Douche chills. They're probably the same thing in this case. I don't know what that means. You got to add that to the list. <laughs> I'm a, I'm gonna, it's going to be a block of text for you. Yeah. That goes on the list. That's pretty amazing. That's like the, that's like the ultimate millennial buzzword I, phrase. Just this assault on the goodness of language continues. Are there some analytics-focused buzzwords that we should eliminate from the lexicon? Like, I feel like data-driven is mm. kind of overused a bit. Yeah, especially like, considering it's all over our website. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Time to edit. <laughs> what about uh, data that's really small, like granular? Granular? Granular data? Yeah, granular data. Or the opposite. Big data. B big data, yes. How else would you say granular data? Very small data. Micro data. Limited, now, now we've got another buzzword. Limited data sets. Yeah, limited data set. There's one that I use a lot, and I think it's relevant. Statistically significant. That comes up a lot. I say that one a lot. That's a math term. Yeah. Yeah. If that, you use it right, I, I wouldn't legit. consider that a buzzword. I'd say that's the real deal. Well, when I order fries, I say I would like a statistically significant amount of fries. <laughs> Is that correct? Is that how I should be? No. We're not, we're not going down this road right now. We'll, we'll wait till the end of the show till things have really spiraled out of control before we reopen. We're not going to bring up waffle fries. I wrote, the, I, I wrote that down. Uh, I wrote down Chick-fil-A because I have some things to say about that. I love the fact that you are sorting through pages and pages and pages of buzzwords. Yeah, can, I got six pages here. Well, and you only have six pages because it's... Maybe seven point. It's font. like size eight font. The the type that I used for my note cards when you could actually bring notes into a, a test, and my teachers didn't know I had a laser printer at the time, <laughs> so I would actually I think it was size four font. So it's pretty pretty close to that. I had to limit it. I almost ran out of paper. It's amazing. You tell you tell kids, even college kids, to study for a test. I'm like, oh, nah, I don't want to do it. You tell them they can bring in a cheat sheet. Mm. The amount of work and the ingenuity that you start to see is mind-blowing. I've been on that side of it. Yep, <laughs> I've done that. I'm guilty of that. Well, I think move the needle is definitely an analytics one. Potentially drink from the fire hose when you're talking about large amounts of data. Oh, yeah. There's also the acronyms that are used, like ASAP and TBD. Smart. EOD. EOD. EOW. End of week. Mm. EOL, end of life. <laughs> That's really good. morbid. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds really final. How do we feel about thought leadership? If, it, if you don't immediately know what it means, then it goes on the list. Because what does it mean? I don't even want to venture. Like, yeah. I, I think I thought that I knew once, but I don't think that I know now. Thought leadership, because it's so convoluted. I'm good at coming up with ideas, but not doing them. That no one's ever had yes. before? Yes. That's what I hear. When someone says thought leadership, let's translate this George Carlin style. Doesn't <laughs> want to do anything. <laughs> I want to talk about stuff. I want to pontificate. Like in reality, that's what it is. But what do you think it's supposed to mean? I think that's exactly what it means. What, what, what people want you to think when they put thought leadership on their resume or whatever is they want you to think that there's some kind of smart person that's out there influencing people and saying how the industry is going to be and that they're really smart and to be respected. Like a futurist. Here, here's the problem with one of these. And, and there are a few like this, but you can't refer to yourself in that way. If someone else wants to refer to you that way, fine. But if I'm going around saying I'm a thought leader, someone needs to just kick me square in the teeth. You're saying basically what you're trying to do is say, I am so far ahead of you with my thoughts that if you don't understand me, oh, you're way behind the times. Yeah. They're, it's a way of separating themselves from the herd. Do you, do you have a laminated to. card that says you're a thought leader? How's this work? 
card carrying a member. Yeah. I try and avoid sports ones because I think I've overused those over the years mm. probably too much. But, Inside baseball. Yeah. Blocking and tackling. Mm -hmm. Hey, we're on the five yard line. We just need to finish this off. You know, that kind of stuff. Yeah. You ever go to use one and people just look at you blankly because they have no idea what you're talking about? Yeah, just keep going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Brian knows. <laughs> <laughs> I've actually dealt with that a lot. So I, I had some some offshore teams, and you know, s setting up offices in in India and other places like that. You every night you don't realize how these things just pollute your speech. Mm. And and you you go to say something, you got a room full of people just looking at you. It ain't good. Well, that's the thing. You definitely have to know your audience. Like if you're if you're kind of talking with someone who comes from another, another culture or another country who might not pick up on what you're throwing down, it can be definitely detrimental to your cause because you're not going to obviously explain it. But I, I think everybody who uses them well <clears throat> knows their audience. They know who they're talking to. So if you're doing a marketing plan for, say, the mafia, you don't want to use the phrase where the bodies are buried. <laughs> Skeletons in the closet. Mm. If you take nothing else away from this show, take cement that shoes. There you go. <laughs> In case you decide to leave the analytics profession, or better yet, take your analytics prowess and go and become an analyst for the mafia. There's some good. I would leave that one out. Yeah. yeah. Two more that really bother me, and one shouldn't bother me, but I think it just it's on the list because it was overused. Passion in all its variants. Passionate. I'm a passionate this or passionate about that. But seriously, though, what's your passion? Buzzwords. Yeah. They're passionate about buzzwords if they're using passion that much, throwing it around. It's like when, you know, I'd, I'd be interviewing people and they'd come in and they'd say, I'm, re I'm really, I'm really passionate about marketing plans. There's two options here. Neither of them are good. You're passionate about marketing plans. That ain't right. Find a hobby. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can't trust you if you are. Build a birdhouse. <laughs> yeah, yeah, if you are, I can't trust you. And if you're not, you're, you're lying to me, which you probably are anyway. So that, that one really bothers me. The one that I think we're starting to see again, even though it sort of went away recently, was hyper. So hyper local, for instance. Yeah, and Uber was around for a while until, you know, mm -hmm. the whole taxi cab. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hyper and yeah. Uber. Yeah, it's funny how some of these change based on the uh, another company or something becoming popular. Like I know that, and I'm sure uh, we'd like to leave politics out of it, but uh, Trump card is one that's changed now, or uh, that trumps everything. That's going to have a different meaning now. Do people not say Trump card because of the president? I think they're more aware of what they're saying. They, I think maybe it's a realization of the buzzwords that they're using. So maybe it's a good thing that they have to think about it now and they maybe think about the other language that they're using. That's interesting. I would never do a disservice to Euchre, the greatest card game in the history of the world, and not use Trump. What's the shelf life for a buzzword? We're, we're just going to skip by that. Euchre is the uh, greatest card game. I like hearts. <laughs> I'm a gin rummy guy. I'm with you on that, but until you go to Wisconsin and you see families ruined over games of euchre really it's hard to appreciate the magnitude <laughs> of it i bet in my family at least one out of five times someone would throw the deck of cards at somebody else and storm off while playing there uh, that's a that's a that's a passion there you ever played euchre no i don't think so i feel like i should have it's a midwest game not a lot of people outside of the midwest know uh, about okay it. it's a great game you would think that after the family breaks apart, they would move away from the Midwest and then spread the word about the the game, or do they just disown it completely? No, because it's the Midwest, so eventually the family will get back together when there's some type of occasion to drink. Mm. Tuesday. But that and Friday fish fries. Mm. That sounds good. Here's one that's somewhat related to analytic, and I think it has more to do with your ability to present to actually get shit done. He's a shower, not a grower. I have yeah. That. yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think I saw that on the list. That's on, that's on the list, yeah. That one's dynamite. Well, I think that's... But it can only be used in the right context. Like, you can't be just throwing that around. 
That's why I say I think they're I think they're very effective if you just know who you're talking to. If you can if you know that utilizing one is going to put a smile on on your audience's face, I say go for it. Mm-hmm. They're fun. But it's about it is about knowing your audience. Just just like just like everything. And then tying this back to analytics, we actually talk about knowing your audience and what's important to them in terms of what you're going to present. A couple of these on douchebag strategists just caught my eye. We live in a post-gig economy powered by a digitally accelerated world. Anyone know what that means? No. Mm-mm. Not even going to try. But I probably heard it in a presentation. Sounds about right. I'm not a strategist. I'm a chief intuition officer. <laughs> Th- this is another key point. Replacing the word between chief and officer Ooh. with... Mm. I, I saw a chief rock star the other day. Okay, yeah, no, that's well, any, unacceptable. Any situation where you just hear somebody who just honest, like obviously made up their title is just kind of arrogant, and narcissistic, and rude. Yeah, and just a violation to humanity. Do you then take that as a sign not to engage with that company? If oh, they absolutely. Have, if they have titles like that, because you then know what you're getting yourself into. Uh, it depends upon what you mean by engage. Do I want to work with them? No. Right. You know, if there's an opportunity to do business, I just kind of know what I'm getting into. That's mm. probably a cue for sure. And my first conversation is going to have, you know, going to evolve a huge smile on my face, you know, because I know exactly <laughs> what's going on. <laughs> That's when you crack out the buzzword sheet and really go to town with them. Yeah. Yeah. Because they, they're, they, they'd they're going to appreciate it. That's yeah. your audience. That's yeah. your audience. Yeah. yeah. That's your buzzword audience. I'm not a strategist. I'm a post-connected content creation influencer. I I feel like it has levels of meaning that all add up to zero, but it sounds good. All, all add up to zero. <laughs> I when I hear these things and I read these things, sometimes I feel like I'm reading middle age poetry and I just am not capable of understanding what every or what every enlightened person seems to get out of it. Mm. The fact that, you, that you've created this list, I think, is extremely important because it's a step in the right direction of what we need to do. Because what we really need to do here is identify those little crutches that don't make any sense, that make you look bad, that don't you know, consider your audience at all. And we need to somehow out, like basically bring those to light and say, don't ever talk like this again. Like, remember th- a few years ago when everybody used the word gamify for everything? Oh, mm. oh, oh. And you don't hear that anymore. And you know why? Because somebody said it probably too many times and just gives everybody the same reaction that you both just had. Well, and the, it's gross. The industry that was, quote, gamifying things was propped up by VC money and they went the way of the dodo. Mm. Uh, went the way of the dodo? Mm. Mm. <laughs> that was very meta. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, one thing that I think is important, and I think you're kind of going on, going down that path, is we don't want these to become so used and overused and misused to where they become the new, literally, where Ugh. people have misused that term so much, where the the dictionary actually has had to redefine literally as the opposite of what it originally meant. Are you serious? Yeah, yes. that's true. They and I'm, I'm guilty it. of that. I, yeah. I do th- I've done that. I apologize. Kate. Are you literally guilty of that? Um, <laughs> literally. In what court? I literally don't even know I'm saying it. <laughs> I, hear the other I use essentially a lot too, which is bad. I got to stop doing that. It's a little crutches. I heard this one the other day. I'm not going to say who said this because you know this person. I'm literally not even joking. <laughs> And that same person also said, I'm like literally dying. Oh, boy. Te- well, technically, technically, that is true. Hey, we're dying every day. Yes. Irregardless, moving on. That's not even a buzzword. That's just poor grammar. That's on the list, though, because people say it enough to where it becomes buzzworthy. It's a fair point. It's overused. Something that's driving me nuts. I, I, I know it's hard for you to believe that something would bother me disruptive Mm. well it depends i think it's i think you uh i think it's overused if people are wanting something to be disruptive but it's never going to be 
Uber is obviously a disruptive company. They've disrupted the taxi cab companies. But when people say disruptive in hopes that something is going to be disruptive, that's probably a definitely a misuse of it. Yeah, and I, th- I think it's dangerous too to go down that rabbit hole where you're. There's another one where you're <laughs> trying to create some disruptive strategy. Like we need to disrupt the the barbershop business. It's like what is that? I could care less. How do you feel about that one? Oh boy, yeah. So you could care less. It's you possible I could you, care less. You don't care as little as possible. You care, you have a little bit of wiggle room at the bottom of your caring. I care to enough. Care less. I don't care so much. I care enough that I could care less. All right. As long as you clarify that, I couldn't care less is the bottom rung of caring. But I could care less. You could be the top. I heard, I was listening to a radio show the other day. And someone used that phrase, I could care less. Mm. And I shouldn't say the other day. It was probably three years ago. And, I, and they're still on the air. I've, I have not brought myself to listen to them again because I cannot stand that. You show the drives me nuts. Yeah. They're Got not going to get my board. listenership. <laughs> okay. I'm not going to hear any of the ads they're running. Who doesn't? <laughs> so let's say you're at a Speaking nice of which, should we run our, uh, should nice we take a little break? Menu or sometimes yeah, they got the not? dessert tray with like stuff that's you know, three days old. It's very intimidating, that dessert tray. Go ahead. It's a lot to choose from. What dessert do you choose? Okay, so what I typically go with is... There's a wrong answer to this. Yeah, I typically just get, it like, after dinner, let's say we've had a couple of drinks or whatever, I've, I've got to get a cup of coffee, and nothing complements that better than a piece of cheesecake. Ding, ding, ding. That is the right answer. Have you ever had Greek cheesecake? I have not. So it's made with Greek cream cheese, which isn't like your typical cream cheese. It's a little bit different. You know why? I assume you're going to tell me. Well, it's a little bit like, you know, you've heard of Greek yogurt. This is Greek cream cheese. Sure. It's high in protein and low in fat. So it's it's essentially taking cheesecake and turning it into a superfood. <laughs> okay. I think the word superfood is thrown around a bit, like kale and whatever else. Well, that's Quinoa. my point. Yeah, but essentially that's exactly right. Okay, so it, let, let, let's say that you've got a fight of the superfoods. You've got kale in this corner. You got spinach in that corner. You got Greek cream cheesecake in this corner. Battle Who's going to win that? Boy, at battle royale. It's not going to be a battle royale. It's going to be a bloodbath. There's going to be one winner walking out of that ring, and it is Greek cream cheesecake. I'm not going to argue with you on that. Absolutely. So Greek cream cheese is a new sponsor of Mayhem to Measurement, and you can find Greek cream cheese at your local grocery or at Walmart or at Target if you've got one of those in your neighborhood. One of the reasons they're a sponsor is because it's just not lip service, Greek cream cheese. It's a great food, but they use data to make decisions about their business. Absolutely. They've done a lot of work to to determine who their customers are, analyzing their customers, segmenting their customers to help them promote their product better and smarter to people who not only love cream cheese, but who will grow to love Greek cream cheese. You want a couple data points? Go ahead. Four times more protein. Half the fat. How's that for analysis and insight? Sounds healthy. Darn right. It's delicious as well. Get yours today. Franklinfoods.com, GreekCreamCheese.com. <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> so during the break, one thing I was thinking about here, I heard disruptive in church two weeks ago. Like, part of the sermon was talking about needing to be disruptive. It's just, these things get said, and we don't, we don't think about them. We, we don't think about what they mean, who's receiving them, how they're coming off. It's almost like we say them because our brains can't process quickly enough, and it's just filler, and somehow this buzzword just magically pops up. It's like the, uh, or, um. Yeah. Toastmasters, yeah. Yeah. We gotta do something about this. Well, I think one of the things that we can we can do collectively is practice. You know, like to- toast mashes is a, is a great example. Like Brian, you did that mm-hmm. for sure. I know you did. Chris, have you ever done that? I have not. You're an excellent speaker. You don't need it. I would like to go. It's worthwhile mm-hmm. because what it allows you to do is focus on what you're saying, because you have people who are specifically listening for little ticks and little crutches. And they will call it out. And sometimes, if, if depending upon what 
Toastmasters club you belong to, they actually ring a bell every time you say, uh. Well, it's like training or, a dog. And yep. so that, you know, ex exactly. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's extremely valuable. But I think from a data presentation standpoint, it's one of those things where you can't get better unless you practice. And you can't get better unless you work with another teammate or a partner who, or whomever to really help you along and get rid of those crutches so that you can improve your presentation quality and also the content of what you're presenting. You can't fix a problem that you don't know exists. So becoming aware of that, of those little ticks, is the, the biggest thing. And even after being out of Toastmasters for oh, several years now, I'm still aware of, of what I say. That's the most important thing you can, you can gain from it is just getting that awareness, that constant self-awareness of what you're saying and how you're saying it. Yeah, and it's really important to start to work on that now before too many trains leave the station. <laughs> <laughs> it is an interesting point, though. I think, you know, actually, looking at, looking at this show, our most popular episode, I think, ever was presenting data. Maybe yeah. not, but even even to this point, it's up there, top three. Yeah, it, it's still, I and mean, that was maybe five, six weeks ago, and that's that still gets plenty of listens every week. And if you did like it, you should certainly be telling all your friends about how great it is. But really, no comment, no insult for that. I thought it was beautiful. <laughs> one thing, I, one thing I did want to say related to that, I said just read uh, just read this article that was super interesting about how to present data better. And the the just quip, uh, the quick piece of advice that the that the author gave was, be brief, be bright, and be gone. And so yeah, you know, use cursory language, you know, show them that you know your stuff, convey value and meaning, and then get out. There's no need to drone on and on, right? Especially when you're talking to senior leadership or, or stakeholders or whomever is making big decisions within an organization. Be brief, be bright, and be gone. And try to avoid buzzwords. Yeah, that timing thing is is really important too. Brevity is, I think, the best way to make a point. If you can make a point quickly, then you can make it well. But the longer it is, the more slides you have, the more you're droning on in your is droning on a buzzword. But the more you're droning on in your presentation, the more you're going to lose an audience. But back to the Toastmaster thing, I think something that a lot of analysts presenting data should do is record themselves. They should understand how they sound, even with this show. Just hearing our voices every week, it's made me very cognizant of ums and all kinds of stuff like that. But understanding how you're coming off to your audience is has got to be key. Yeah, you got to practice that. Closed mouths don't get fed, guys. <laughs> you guys should see the smirk on his face right now. He's so proud of himself. <laughs> literally patting myself. Literally patting myself in the back. <laughs> like you're not even joking. Uh, going beyond recording, too, if you ever have to do a speech anytime I've had to do a speech in front of anybody I'll record myself with video as well because you don't even know what are the little mannerisms you have how you move around the room yeah. or don't move around the room so you know it adds that other dimension of delivery beyond just the speech part and it's nice to see how people respond to you as well you can judge by body language and things like that in terms of are people paying attention are people on their phones are they on their laptops just understanding the different things you can do to keep command of the room certainly play very, very well. The onus is on you. <laughs> That's probably a good one to end on. <laughs> All right. So you can find Brian, brianrenner.com. Can they find you on Twitter, LinkedIn? Probably. Yeah. I don't, <laughs> I don't, I don't frequent Twitter good too for much. You. Yeah. <laughs> LinkedIn. Yeah. I'm, I'm in this industry. So I hope if you search for my name, Brian Renner, you will find me somehow. If people have things that they want to submit, are they able to submit oh, these to your site? Feel free. Yeah. But do it in a way that is funny. <laughs> <laughs> Give an example, you know, a real, real world life example. Give me a little backstory. Because I have in this buzzword list, it's not just a list of buzzwords. It's what company was I working at at the time? Who said it? Are there any notes? I do have notes next to some of these buzzwords because it, there is context with some of these. Some of these are not just annoying buzzwords. They're almost poetic, and I want to make sure that the people get the credit for that. Yeah, just don't lob it up there. You really got to hit the sweet spot. <laughs> it's almost going to become Urban Dictionary for buzzwords. <laughs>
All right. Well, I think that's about all we got for this one. Check out Brian, brianrenner.com. If you want to get in touch with the show, info at metrotagency.com. You can find Chris and myself on Twitter. Yeah. Thank you, Brian, for joining us. Thank you for having me. Enjoyed wrestling the skater with you. (laughs) Oh, boy. (laughs) And on that note, we're wishing you all a great week. We will be back next week. We're going to cover some SEO metrics, get back to some real analytics-oriented content for you. So until then, go get them. Fight the good fight, Christian Soldier. Is that one? Christian That's Soldier? one. Yeah. All right, <laughs> play the music.